happy Sunday! Hashtag my global family. This is Dre Abeda, coyote walking in this world and real life Estelado Pueblo superhero. Thank you for joining me for August 1st Sunday service. Family, today is a good day and thank you for joining me to nourish your spiritual selves. This coyote has been waiting and is so excited to be spending some time with you. Family, per tradition, let us go ahead and do an indigenous land acknowledgement because all of our humans on this world have been marked by coloniality family. And I include my white brothers, sisters, and non-binary siblings. All of our lives have been affected by history. So family, right now, Right now, I would like for you to close your eyes for a moment, bow your heads, and think upon the ground you stand. What sacrifices were made so that you could be there today? What blood was spilt? What wars were fought? What sacrifices and lives were lost? This coyote is currently standing on indigenous land. I am a proud warrior from the Pueblo of Asleta, and our wonderful state of New Mexico has 23 diverse and individual tribes that represent all of our peoples. So don't forget family, all of our communities are here and well, and together we survive and thrive. At this moment, family, I am gonna start our service with our opening prayer. And do not forget, family, we are the house of spirituality. We are the house of critical theory, which means that our readings do not come from a religious text, but rather from sociological studies, real life experiences, or our original indigenous epistemologies and ways of knowing. So I use coyote and Napi stories in order to make sense of this world, family. So join me here every week as we work in our minds, our bodies, and our spirits together. When we pray, family, do not also forget, all we are doing is saying hello to our ancestors and those who have gone before us. Join me in saying hello. Don't forget, family, they are always with us and all we have to do is open our minds and say a prayer or just say something in our hearts. They listen, and all we can do is ask. Hello, Gammy. It is your favorite trickster coyote granddaughter. I miss you, Gammy. It's August, and we have birthdays, and we have family celebrations, and school starting, and I miss you. I miss your presence. I miss how everything seemed okay when you were just hanging out with Gammy. May you send us your blessings to all of your maternal figures in this world. May they be female or male, that nurturing figure who brings safety and security and love to our peoples, allow our maternal figures to thrive. May they find their own pockets of safety and may they continue to get nourishment as they nourish our communities. Dear Papa, I miss you. <laughs> And I hope you got good TV reception up there. I'm sure you're getting all of the games. I miss you, Papa, and you were the most patient person that I knew in this world. Your example was all kindness, and don't worry, Hita, we'll figure it out. So Papa, send us some of your patience to your communities as we get started to go back to school. And to our great great grandpa Pablo Beta, true Isleta statesman and revolutionary, thank you, Papa, for all of your sacrifices. Send us some strength in all of your leaders here as we deal with institutions and paperwork and we try to make change in this world for the dehumanizing situations our communities find ourselves in. Please allow us to find those tricks and ways and laws and voices that will emancipate and empower all of our peoples. And to all of our aunties, gammies, cousins, both adopted and blood, who have ever treated us with dignity, kindness, respect, and lifted us up, may you all rest in peace and send us your blessings. 
family. Today's reading comes from a very, very, very special text. Today, it's the white architects of black education, ideology, and power in America, 1865 to 1954. The author today is William H. Watts. Dear family, it is also published by Teachers College Press, 2001. Family, today's topic is scientific racism, and I would like for you to think on how scientific racism may or may not have affected your life if you were a person of color. Now, racism is real, family, and it affects all of our lives, but it is not an idea that is in a vacuum. It's actually written about, it's published about, it is studied, and how scientific racism is affecting our communities not only today, but it literally started, um, you know, when academics and researchers first even deigned to study people of color family. And I want you to think about that. The title of this text today is The White Architects of Black Education. Because let's be realistic on who has controlled the educational processes for our communities of color. It has not been ourselves. It was only in recent decades literally recent decades, family, that we have had any community control over what our children learn in schools. And I am literally talking about less than 50 years ago, family, our children were still being kidnapped and sent to boarding schools. So again, we must reflect and be very, very critical on where we've come, how far we've come, and how far we still have to go. Our intro today is literally just introducing the idea of scientific racism so that we can start to get a handle on how it affects our lives. Scientific racism. Many colonial educators in America embrace the tenets of biological determinism as legitimate explanations for societal development. The naked and brutal exploitation of people of color provided context for quote, color coding and classifying, quote, scientifically rendering dark people as inferior, help justify and rationalize colonial plunder. If proof could demonstrate that nature rendered white superior, a ready-made explanation for social hierarchy could be established. As world hegemony and power shifted from Europe across the Atlantic during the 19th century, America became the main locus of white supremacy. Its virulent brand of slavery outlasted all others. Long after European countries, long after most European countries had abandoned slavery in the slave trade, the United States continued both its economy and social order on the foundation of slave labor, exploited labor, and subservience. This economic base could not help but shape social ideology by reconstruction of modern sociology of race was firmly embedded. Race influenced every aspect of America's social order. Moreover, it made its presence felt in both culture making and culture makers. Now let's think about that family. Scientific racism is literally talking about how the colonial powers, how the empires that literally still continue to run today. How often, you, um, dear family, if you are a United States citizen, do we think of ourselves as an empire? How often do we recognize that we still have colonies, that we still have commonwealths? that we still have territories in the modern age. And I'm asking you, family, how much longer will we keep these displaced people under our colonial rule? People in Puerto Rico may be US citizens, but they cannot vote for the US president unless they live on the upper 50, uh, 48. If they're living on the island of Puerto Rico, their vote for US president does not count unless they're living in a other state in, in the United States, right? One of the 50 states and are registered to vote in that state. If they are literally just a Puerto Rican on Puerto Rico, when they vote in the election, their vote does not count. So we have layers family, and we have some citizens and some not quite citizens. 
We are not equal under this law. And that literally is because racism was written into our constitution. Family, these ideas are not made in a vacuum. And as the introduction of scientific racism talks about, this is part of social control with our society. Why did the colonial powers establish a racial social hierarchy? Again, as it says, it is to justify colonial plunder. How can we massacre and create genocide after genocide for native peoples, enslaved black people, and kill them at will? How can we justify them as a lower order race? You find a scientist, you do a study, you write a book and get it published, and people will start to believe. So once you start embedding racism in our ideologies, in our textbooks, and you start normalizing and blaming people for their own situations, that is how we institutionalize racism. The first reading from our book today, now that we have a working understanding of what scientific racism is, I want us to go back to the father of scientific racism. His name was Arthur de Gobineau, and please excuse me for my French pronunciation family. He further argued, and this starts on page 26 to 27, he further argued that all civilizations derive from the white race, especially the superior Aryan stock. Mankind is thus divided in races of unequal worth, Superior races are in a fight to maintain their positions. Racial relationships then become a driving force in history. He offered a hierarchy of race that influenced the next century and a half. At the top were Caucasian, Semitic, and Japhetic peoples. The second or yellow group consisted of Altic, Mongol, Finnish, and Tartar people. Tar, tar people. The lowest group was combined of Hamites or Blacks. He sets out descriptions of each group. White people were characterized by, quote, energetic intelligence, great physical power, stability, inclinations to self-preservation, and a love of life and liberty. Their great weakness, according to Gobineau, was a susceptibility to cross-breeding. Asians were mediocre, lacked physical strength, and wished to live undisturbed. They could never create a viable civilization. People, black people, the lowest of all, possessed energy and willpower, but were unstable, unconcerned about the preservation of life, given to absolutes and easily enslaved. Theoretically, Gubanyo delivered a notion of racial determinism. He insisted racial determinism was objective and could be reduced to scientific law. His racial view of history meant that race had driven all events since the beginning of time and racial theory was more scientific than political morality or state organization. In Esau, Gobineau wrote about race and social order he believed that civilization defined itself in the process of war, conquest, and migration. It was, however, these interactions that allowed miscegenation to occur. If unchecked, miscegenation would undo civilization. For Gobineau, advanced status and civilization, such possessed by Aryans, could survive only in a rigidly hierarchical order. An elite must totally dedicate itself to the maintenance of a racial and social hierarchy and use force and domination to maintain the racial, social, and economic organization. Society must not be disrupted by popular classes or low, lower social groups. Now think about that family. This is the father of scientific racism, literally giving white people in power during the 1860s the excuses and literally scientifically, right? Scientifically at the time, proving that the people that they had enslaved 
that the people that they had conquered, that all the land that they have taken from these lower order groups were somehow deserved. That somehow this fit his scientific profiling of these racial groups. Now, family, we know that this is racism literally being dressed up as research, as legitimate knowledge. This dehumanizes our people and this is antiquated, yet these same ideas still influence policy today. How many times have we heard our experts on the television, our politicians at the, at the, at the, in, in their giant rallies? Oh my gosh, you guys, seriously, rallies? When, when did that become a thing? Rallies with millions of people, especially during COVID, that became a rallying point for people, but also literally was a spreader, right? That populism, the idea that you have to be a celebrity in order to run for president, you have to be a millionaire. It's not an idea, it's a reality. In order for you actually to, to attain those positions, you have to be incredibly wealthy. We are ruled by an oligarchy family, which means that our society is ruled by the rich and the few. It is not a true democracy. But those ideas that even who has the ability to rule themselves comes from the roots of scientific racism. And our last reading today, family, is going to give you those specific examples. And as I read through these heartbreaking, heart-rendering examples of how scientists and quote-unquote academics who wrote the book on the current theories that we use now in academia. I want you to think and hear about the racist comments, the findings from their study. And I want you to see, do you still hear these same utterances today? Do you still hear these same disparaging remarks against black Americans, against Mexican Americans, against Native Americans? Do you still hear these same disparaging remarks about immigration uh, populations about undocumented people in the United States and I want you to ask yourselves is that true or is this bias is this racist and is this part of a bigger plan of social control only until we embrace each other based on our common experiences as human beings will we actually start to deconstruct the chains that still enslave us today it may not be modern, actual physical chains unless you're incarcerated in the cradle of prison pipeline, but they're ideolog ideological. We literally chain ourselves down every day by saying these spaces aren't for us or held by literal institutional ideolog ideologies that say because you're a woman, you're not as worthy as a man and therefore should be paid 70 cents to the dollar that he makes or you are not as qualified as a native person against a white counterpart because you were just um, a, a box, uh, what did they call it? An affirmative action hire, right? Um, when I was going to Dartmouth College back, way back, don't want to date myself family, but the disparaging term at the time was box checker, right? Because there were lines. Were you authentically part of those communities? Because there was and always has been throughout history, um, white co-opting of identities that were not theirs. Rachel Dozell, that white person who claimed black identity, one of the most uh, infamous examples of late, right? But I'm asking you, how much longer are we gonna allow this racist rhetoric to hold our people in bondage? Because literally, you see it on television, you believe it. You hear a president speak those words and millions of people in the United States will listen. So when are we gonna become critical thinkers on our own? When are we gonna use our own experiences and challenge the dominant ideology of bootstrapping and colorblindness that says all you have to do is work hard and everything will be okay? We don't see color and if you didn't make it, if you didn't get that job, if you didn't get that house, if you didn't get that credit card, it's because of your own failings and not looking at the intersectional view of was it language, was it citizenship, was it gender, was it race, was it class, that were the real life barriers that affected your experience. Our last reading today, families, on page 28, 
and this ex expanding the discourse medicine and science and I want you again to think about these examples hear these examples and I want you to how do we see iterations of these even today scientific racism was reinforced and expanded when the established medical profession entered the field. Notions of anatomical, physiological, and psychological differences framed the medical inquiry. Benjamin Rush, founding father, signed under the Declaration of Independence and medical doctor, contributed to views of race and racial inferiority in the early period of the nation. As Surgeon General in the Revolutionary Army and Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Rush had a national podium. Concerned with the survival of the young republic, he spoke out on questions of politics, morality, education, and race. Rush examined the, quote, savage American Indians, claiming they were given to, quote, uncleanliness, quote, nastiness, quote, idleness intemperance, stupidity, and indecency. By the early 1770s, he was writing about Black Americans, slavery, and race relations. Intellectually and politically opposed to slavery, he nevertheless advocated for a segregated society. He believed Blacks to be pathologically infected. Their coloration was disease-driven. In a paper derived to the American Physiological Society entitled Observations Intended to Favor a Supposition that the Black Color of the N-Word is Derived from Leprosy. He presented views on Black pathology. He argued about the big lip, flat nose, woolly hair, and black skin were characteristics of lepers. He also wrote about insensitive nerves, uncommon strength, and venereal desires. Blacks needed to be civilized and restored to morality and virtuously through righteous living. As a political figure and doctor, Rush helped shape the culture of racism characterized early America and evolving over the next two centuries. Much of his medical practice evolved work with the mentally ill as he turned his attention to, quote, diseases of the mind. His preoccupations, morality, and virtue came to be conjoined with his exploration of mental disease. He began to insist that idleness, intemperance, masturbation, and sexual excess were associated with mental diseases. His book, Diseases of the Mind, 1812, presented, quote, remedies for these problems. In his mid-19th century, in the mid-19th century, Physicians such as John, Dr. John H. Van Eer offered a, quote, scientific justification of slavery. He wrote that dark-skinned people were, quote, diseased and unnatural, and that blacks possessed impediments, weakened vocal organs, coarse hands, hypersensitive skin, narrow longitudinal heads, narrow foreheads, and underdeveloped brains and nervous systems. Van Eer then Erie, Erie, Erie concluded that the aggregation of these traits translated into human inferiority. He asserted that even the animal kingdom recognized n-word inferiority and said that a hungry tiger was more likely to prey on blacks than whites. Also writing on this topic in the 1850s was Dr. Samuel Carwright, who chaired a committee to inform the Medical Association of Louisiana about the black race. His report on diseases and physical peculiarities of the N race gained attention for its scholarly approach. He spoke of the insuff insufficient supply of red blood, smaller brain, and excessive nervous manner found in the N word. This combination of problems, wrote Cartwright, led to the debasement of minds in blacks. The physical exercise provided by slavery would help increase lung and blood functions, according to Cartwright. Slaves, he argued, sometimes were afflicted by Drake Tom's mania, a disease of the mind, making them want to run away. The prescription for Drake Tom mania, he argued, was care and kindness, but the whip 
should not be spared should kindness fail. Now let's think about this family. These are our founding fathers. These are the medical professionals who literally are paving the way for how our current academics and health professionals think about communities of color. These dehumanizing terms while using science and physiology and psychology and creating diseases such as, uh, let's repeat that again. That was drapetomania, right? It was a disease that prone slaves to run away. Ignoring the actual human condition in which they were living, in which we have sociological studies and historical documentation of black mothers killing their children rather than allowing them to live through slavery. So I'm asking you, family, how has this racist history that is being erased, literally, you have to get a college degree and specifically study a subject, find an author who writes about this in order to get this information. You will never find this in mainstream educational processes. And I'm asking you, what is that doing to our civilization? To rewrite history and to ignore the harm that literally still influences how we look at people of color today. Why are there such huge gaps in the prison um, industrial complex when it comes to our outcomes of sentencing, race and class are the number one factors. When it comes to healthcare disparities and who receives care and who is perceived to be an addict, race and class always play a part. So I'm asking you, family, although these readings are coming from the past, we still hear the rhetoric and it still dehumanizes and controls and hurts and harms our society today. So join me, family, in creating new ways of dealing with our societal issues. Because the war on drugs was false. It was about creating a new slave labor. The prison industrial complex is modern slavery family. They create more laws to create more criminals to make sure that the money does not stop flowing. So I'm asking you family, use your minds, use this history, and use your actual lived experiences to create and be the change in the world. And through that, we are going to nourish our spiritual selves, family. Through that, we are going to start the process of healing and knowing because then I understand your pain. Then I understand your suffering. When I share my story of being a survivor of rape and molestation as a ramification of Indian boarding schools, that means something because millions of our people have been affected by that. There's no reason that every woman in my family should have been marked by that violence. And that is because we repeat these cycles of violence and we keep doing it until we have the courage to talk about them. Until we have the courage to look at our history in the face and say, yes, we did that. How can we heal and how can we move forward? This coyote loves you. May you have a glorious day. Please take this knowledge with you. I love you all. And remember, if everything is not okay right now, family, it is not you. It is a dehumanizing situation called COVID, the white supremacist capitalist empire that we live in. But you are not alone. And this coyote pastor is only a phone call, text message, or email away. I love you. Have a good evening. I am off to guys trouble somewhere else. <laughs>